Hey, hey, my lovelies. It's Alicia Garza, and I am the principal at the Black to the Future Action Fund. We are just getting started here. So let's just see what we got going on. Mm-hmm. Hey, hey, booze. Hey, hey. Welcome, welcome to everyone. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. Happy Friday, y'all. We made it. It's a real thing. <laughs> it's a real thing. Uh, go ahead and shout yourself out in the chat. Let us know where you're coming from, where you're at, and maybe even give us uh, an idea of what you're going to do this weekend. All right, all right. Here we go. Uh-huh. Okay. And let's make sure we're getting Kate in here. Hey, hey, Novi Ford from Georgia. All right. Uh-huh. Let's see. Okay. Hey, y'all. We're so excited that you're here. Hey, 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 Georgia, stand up. All right. We're about to get it popping. Here we go. Hey, hey, from Oakland, represent. All right. Let's see if we can get this popping here. Oh, I see one. Georgia, stand up. I see two. Yes, we are doing this. Hi, y'all. Good to see you. Hello. 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 So we're getting it popping now. So I just want to say welcome to everybody who is joining us for our Cyber Cipher series on housing. Um, what we're trying to do today is talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the housing crises, both in states, but also nationally. Um, particularly in Black communities. We're also going to be talking a little bit about the history of housing discrimination in our country and how it has led us to this point of impending mass displacement, meaning everybody getting kicked out their house, okay? <laughs> Number three, we are going to be talking about the urgency of this moment for our health and well-being, as well as our long-term needs. Y'all know that the current eviction moratorium expires. Yes, honey, it expires on June 30th. So, you know, we're not going to let that happen. We got to take some action. And lastly, we are going to, this is a lot of goals. We got a lot of goals in a very short amount of time. Mm-hmm, Kiana, mm-hmm. All right, now, um, we are going to talk about the American <laughs> Rescue Plan. We're going to share our Build Back Boulder mandate, and we are going to ask you, to join us in making sure that Congress and the administration is adopting these policies. Because what we know is that Black voters delivered a mandate for change when we stood in line for hours at these polls, honey. So we expect some change. OK, so we're about to get into it. I am joined by two of my faves. Um, I'm here with Kate Little, who is the Special Projects Director for Georgia Stand Up which is one of the preeminent social justice and housing rights organizations in the Southeast. Kate has expertise in housing affordability policy issues, is the former president and CEO of Georgia Advancing Communities Together Incorporated, a statewide network of nonprofit housing and community development organizations, and was awarded the 2018 Freedom Award by the Georgia Commission on Equal Opportunity. Welcome, 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 Ms. Little. We also are being joined by our very own Kiana Gregory, who is the political director at the Black to the Future Action Fund. Kiana is a beast. That's just what you need to know about Kiana. And also has been organizing in the Southeast for quite some time. So thank you both for joining us. And let's jump into the conversation. Kate, I want to start with you. So. We know that the crisis happening in housing didn't occur overnight. It is um, decades in the making, really, and it's reached a critical tipping point, in part due to the Rona. Can you share with us a brief history of how housing discrimination 
um, has rolled out over this last period and how it's leading us to this point of housing insecurity. And let's talk about what's going to happen to people who are housing insecure. Okay, that's a mouthful. So let's start out with a, a little bit of history. And let me say um, first, thank you for inviting me to participate in this Cypher series. Uh, and I'll second what you said about uh, Kiana. She has been on the case and keeping me on my toes. Mm -hmm, me too. So, um, <laughs> so good afternoon and, and welcome um, to the audience. I want to um, talk a little bit, as Alicia said, about the historical inequities which have led to not only the housing conditions that African Americans face today, but also to our quality of life in general. And to paint the picture, I'm going back not decades, but actually centuries, mm. although it's not gonna take me forever. <laughs> I'm going back to the beginnings of this nation. When most people talk about housing inequities, um, we start with the practice of redlining. However, if we think of housing as the major wealth building tool available to most Americans, we really need to go back much further than the 1930s and 40s. In establishing the colonies in the New World, Britain offered head rights to the settlers that consisted of 50 acres of land for each person in the household. So not for each household, but each person in the household. When the colonies broke from Great Britain, those white males who fought in the Revolutionary War were rewarded with land grants, free land. In 1862, under the Homestead Act, United States citizens received 1.6 million homestead grants, amounting to hundreds of millions of acres taken from the indigenous peoples and redistributed again to mostly white males. In the early 2000s, one researcher estimated that fully a quarter of the U.S. adult population had descended from homestead grant recipients. So here I want you to think about generational wealth building. I think we're all familiar with what happened after the Civil War during Reconstruction and the failed promise of 40 acres and a mule to those previously enslaved in the Confederate States. However, following Reconstruction and into the 20th century, sharecropping, lynching, incidents such as Rosewood and the Tulsa riots, and the Black Codes enacted by Southern states all served to discourage, inhibit, or prohibit land ownership by African Americans. In the 1930s, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board asked the Home Owners Loan Corporation, which was established to provide long-term mortgages, to create residential security maps for 239 cities, for those cities with a population of 40,000 or greater. The Federal Housing Administration's appraisal manuals instructed banks not to lend in areas of infamous racial groups. Private institutions or organizations created maps to meet FHA regulations. Neighborhoods were color-coded on maps, green for the best, blue for still desirable, yellow for definitely declining, and red for hazardous. Although the examiners systematically graded neighborhoods on a number of criteria, such as the age and condition of housing, transportation access, closeness to amenities such as parks or undesirable features, such as polluting industries, economic class and employment status of residents, a neighborhood's ethnic and racial composition really became the defining characteristic. Redlining meant that African-American families were denied access to capital from conventional sources, such as lending institutions, which offered standard loan terms and, and market interest rates to other non-black and brown people. We had to obtain subprime loans or enter into contract deeds. In addition to these government actions, real estate agents, appraisers, and lenders thwarted home ownership aspirations of African Americans through blockbusting deed restrictions made to order property valuation and predatory lending. It was common practice to include racial exclusionary clauses and contracts based on racially restrictive covenants. 
While redlining was banned with the Fair Housing Act of 1968, the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, a national nonprofit organization, found in a 2018 study that most of the neighborhoods, 74% that the Homeowners Loan Corporation rated as high risk or hazardous eight decades ago are low to moderate income today. Additionally, most of those areas graded hazardous nearly 64% are minority neighborhoods now. Until 1962, fewer than 2% of FHA mortgages went to people of color. We talk about the wealth gap and the difference in home ownership rates of white and black Americans. The gap is really as wide as the Grand Canyon and caused not just by decades of redlining, but as I hope I have demonstrated, centuries of preferential treatment for some and discriminatory practices for others. The foreclosure crisis during the Great Recession and related factors have resulted in renters now outnumbering homeowners in nearly half of all major cities, up from just 21% a decade ago. The reason that I focus on home ownership is not that renting is bad, but that home ownership represents the largest source of wealth for the average American household. The inequities built into the system show up today in appraisals which undervalue property in predominantly black and brown neighborhoods, in exclusionary zoning, which prohibits the development of multifamily housing and requires development of single family houses on large lots and the distribution of impact fees. In terms of today and the impact um, brought about by COVID-19, you can still clearly see the historical legacy in black and brown neighborhoods. The iniquities show up looking not at just the housing conditions, but the totality of the environmental, educational, economic opportunities available in black and brown neighborhoods. I'm sure all of you have heard about zip code being one indication of destiny, that if you can tell where a child is growing up, that gives you some idea of that child's ability to actually be upwardly mobile. And Atlanta is a great example of that, as we are known as usually in the top three to five um, cities with, with the most income inequality. But these neighborhoods that were initially redlined still suffer today from poor housing and overcrowded conditions. So when you talk about COVID-19 and the need for social distancing, it's very hard to social distance when you're in an overcrowded house. And one of the reasons we're in overcrowded housing is because the lack of availability of affordable housing. So we have to double up and triple up in order to afford housing. And in some cases, in many cases, the housing even doubling up is substandard housing. In the South, we have a problem with mold, for instance. Um, there's also pest inf infestation. But in, in addition to the housing conditions, these neighborhoods also suffer from, in, um, from continuing envir environmental challenges, from poor schools, and a host of other problems. So COVID-19 shows up in black and brown neighborhoods because we don't have grocery stores where we can get fresh produce, where we can get unprocessed food. So there, it's like a, a spinning top going round and round. What, if one thing leads to another thing leads to another thing. But it all boils down to, in one, worse, uh, in one word, racism. Racism okay. is still with us today, and the discriminatory impact of racism is still with us today. Mm -hmm. So I don't wanna go on and on. Let me just end by saying, I'm gonna uh, quote from a, a recent report released by Grounded Solution mm -hmm. and the National Initiative on Mixed Income Communities. For far too long, housing policies and practices such as redlining, local zoning codes, real estate steering, block bus busting, contract selling, and restrictive covenants have been used to reinforce racism. All these actions directly benefited white investors and homeowners while reinforcing disinvestment and limiting wealth for black, brown, and other families of color. 
the cumulative outcome has produced a dramatic black-white wealth gap. The net worth of a typical white family is nearly 10 times greater than that of a black family. Mm -hmm. So I apologize if I've gone on too no, long, but don't apologize. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> don't apologize, you were so thorough and you were breaking down that we are in a state of emergency. And I'm seeing in the chat, people are talking about housing racism and that's exactly what's going on here. So let's bring Kiana into this conversation because I, I think we know things are bad, right? And you gave such a comprehensive and also easy to digest um, history of how we got here. But I'm not sure that people fully grasp how urgent and precarious our current housing situation is. So Kiana, can you talk a little bit to some of the national data that we're seeing in relationship to current eviction rates, which um, clearly uh, our communities are most vulnerable to eviction, right? And talk a little bit about what experts are predicting if things continue the way that they've been going. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Miss Kate, for your kind words. It's such a privilege to be uh, in this cipher with you and talking about housing. Um, things are really bad, y'all. Not a little bad, but really bad. And I think Miss Kate did a brilliant job of laying out how not decades, but centuries of very intentional discrimination, uh, systems that have been put in place to keep us out of desirable areas, to prevent us from building wealth, have led us to this moment. And the numbers are shocking. So I wanna read some of them to you and I wanna be really specific because I think we all hear stories and we know just from our personal networks and connections that people are struggling. But I think it's important to put a really fine point on the scope of the problem so that later in the conversation when we start talking about what's needed, we all have a clear understanding of why scale and being bold is so critically important to this moment because if we just try to nibble around the edges, uh, it's going to be insufficient and we won't get there. So right now today, in the last 60 days, two point, and I'm just going to talk about Black folks for a moment. So just know that things are worse, but I'm going to focus on our communities for the next few minutes. In the last 60 days, 2.75 million Black renters have named that they are not currently caught up on payments and fear imminent meeting in the next 30 days, eviction. That number goes down a little bit when you talk about Black home ownership, but not much. That's still 1.4 million people who are imminently concerned about foreclosure and then eviction. Right now, even with the moratoriums in place, because what I want to do is, or what I want to share is that the moratoriums are important and they've now been in place for the better part of a year. As Alicia mentioned earlier, they're set to expire next on June 30th. But even having had a moratorium on evictions in place, and essentially that just means that we have halted them, we have still had thousands, tens of thousands of Black renters evicted. And what we know from having collected data over the past year that we've been in the pandemic is that Black renters are two times as likely to be evicted than their white counterparts. So these are the numbers that we're dealing with in the hundreds of thousands, in the millions. Even when you just look at Black communities, Black women even still are at a higher risk and are more vulnerable for eviction. And what we know or what the experts tell us is that a housing apocalypse, this is their word, not mine, is we are on the precipice, meaning if we don't do something, not just to make sure that people can stay in their homes, but if we don't do something to think about what happens when the moratoriums end and people still owe thousands of dollars in back rent, then we are going to find ourselves in a situation that's untenable. Yep, Mildred, you said it. People are still being evicted in the Black community with the moratorium in place because what good is a moratorium if we don't know about it? What good is a moratorium if we can't access the paperwork and the documentation to file the claim? And we see over and over and over again that our communities are most vulnerable to not having that information and to still being evicted. Mm -hmm. 
Miss Kate, is there anything that you want to add to that from looking at what's happening specifically in Georgia? Well, I do want to add just a couple of things in terms of, you mentioned the American Rescue Plan. So I was actually um, on a call yesterday. So in December, um, the, uh, the former administration uh, did approve $25 billion for, for housing. And most of that, I believe, was for um, rental assistance, not necessarily for homeowners. Um, the government-sponsored entities, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, have instructed um, their lenders not to foreclose, but you need to know whether or not your mortgage is with Fannie or Freddie, and there are some resources to do that. More recently, in March, under the American Rescue Plan, an additional um, bill, $30 billion was allocated for emergency rental assistance. Most of this assistance is available at the state level through um, the State Housing Finance Agency. So for any of you on this call who are, or Instagram, I don't know what you call it, on this meeting, you on this cycle. You good, you good on the um, cycle, that's right. <laughs> uh, if, you're, if you're not just in, in the interest of sharing information, if you're not familiar with um, the State Housing Finance Agency in your community, you can go to, it is in Nancy, N-C-S-H-A, and it lists all, uh, all 50 housing finance agencies in the country and gives, I believe, their website address and also their phone number. If you are in a major metropolitan area, certain um, localities actually received money separate from the state that can also be used for emergency rental assistance. And this last tranche of money, there is also some set aside for mortgage assistance. The money for rental assistance can also be used to pay for utility. And the money can be used for back rent and also um, going forward. And in the call I was on yesterday, all of the agencies that were represented said that they were not going to cap the amount of money that households need in order to come current and remain current. One of the other things to mention in terms of the CDC mor moratorium is that it only pertains to non-payment of rent. And landlords, property owners, I'm trying not to, after learning the origin of the term landlord, I'm trying not to use that anymore. I don't want to give credence to lords of the land. <laughs> so I want to talk about property owners and property management um, companies, you can still be evicted um, for reasons other than non-payment of rent. So one of the things that, in terms of a call to action is we do need to ask the administration to strengthen the CDC moratorium and to address and to just blanketly say there's a moratorium on evictions. The second part of that is um, some property owners are actually going to court to overturn the um, eviction moratorium. And some, um, some courts have agreed that the moratorium is unconstitutional. So the CDC moratorium actually uh, contains a compliance or enforcement provision. And so while this is in the courts, the CDC or the administration HUD needs to look at beginning to enforce um, the prohibition against eviction and start levying fines as a counter to the action that the courts are taking. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So let's talk about the, we are bringing the real real today. You absolutely right, Jay Bird. Okay, so let's talk about um, the American Rescue Plan. And uh, we're still in President Biden's first 100 days We've already seen a lot to be encouraged by, that's for sure, namely the American Rescue Plan that was passed by Congress several weeks ago, which outlines and the outlines of his next major piece of legislation that will focus on infrastructure. Um, so we saw that there's gonna be $400 billion for care. Shout out to domestic workers, honey. <laughs> um, um, but I, I want to 
talk and hear a little bit more about the president's moratorium extension, which we just talked a little bit about, but if there's anything to add there. And let's talk about what's actually in this legislation, because I still feel like people don't know. We're just rolling out bills, you know, trillions of dollars being thrown out there. And now we know the government can do it, honey, when they want to. Now we know. They done messed around and showed us that when they want to, honey, they can put that money right where it's supposed to go. Um, so look, how do both of these bills, right? The infrastructure bill, the American Rescue Plan, how do both of these bills um, stack up against our mandate, the Build Back Boulder mandate for the Biden-Harris administration? Uh, Kiana, let me start with you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that question. So I'm excited to talk about Build Back Boulder. I think some of you are probably familiar, those of you who've been on our website, who are on our email list. For those of you who are not on our email list, I need you to sign up today. We'll make sure you get the links. But Build Back Boulder is our policy platform for how we make sure our communities are prioritized and protected. So what we know is that Black voters, I want to give a shout out to Atlanta, um, delivered legislative and governing trifectas to the administration and to members of Congress. We came out and voted in historic numbers. And because of that, they now have the legislative power and ability to, move, to pass legislation to make our communities powerful. So Build Back Boulder is a policy platform and a roadmap that aims to give them a baseline for how we make sure that a lot of those broad policy commitments around racial equity are actually turned into legislation um, that makes our communities better. So it touches on four major areas, the areas that President Biden has told us are near and dear to his heart. We talk a lot about COVID and COVID equity and vaccine distribution. We talk about the economy, of course, that's top of mind for everyone. We talk about the importance of addressing white nationalism for the attack on our national security that it is. And we talk a great deal about housing. As Ms. Kate brilliantly laid out, housing has been a problem for decades. And even in 2018, when we did our Black Census and asked you all, what are the top policy priorities that you want to see elected officials address? 86% of you told us that housing was important and that low wages were keeping you up at night. So what I will say about the similarities between Build Back Boulder, the American Rescue Plan, and what we are seeing come together in terms of the American Jobs Plan is that they all address housing affordability, which is key. Ms. Kate spoke to some of that. They do a great job of starting to address homelessness, um, I think we're now at 5 million people suffering from homelessness or housing insecurity in the country. Um, and they do a great job of making sure that a lot of the discriminatory policies that have been put into place are being taken off the books. So I think those are our three big areas of commonality. What I will say specifically about the American Rescue Plan is that in addition to providing rental assistance, which Ms. Kate has already touched on, it also provides $5 billion for emergency housing vouchers, an additional $5 billion for people suffering from homelessness, $750 million for our indigenous brothers and sisters, Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, um, emergency assistance for rural housing. We know that particularly Black rural communities are being hit hard that they don't have the access to healthcare that they need to appropriately fight this virus. And it's just, as Ms. Kate said, a spinning top. And last but not least, it also provides assistance for people who have been victims of housing discrimination. So it provides funds for additional fair housing activities. Um, I will say in terms of the bill that's going to be coming out and what we are seeing about the outlines of that, Again, it really focuses on going back and looking at housing affordability, looking at areas and communities that were set aside for affordable housing, but as Ms. Kate uh, named earlier, are crumbling. So either the pipes are a problem, or we have insect infestation, or they were built by a toxic waste site. There are a dozen different reasons that housing 
uh, affordable housing in this country in its present form is not safe and it's not ideal to raise a family. And so a lot of what President Biden proposes in this new bill, the American Jobs Plan, is that we address that and retrofit those homes. He also talks about building and rehabilitating more than half a million homes for low income and middle income home buyers. Again, he talks about eliminating exclusionary zoning and harmful land use policies, which we talk at length about and build back Boulder. And finally, there's more, but I'll stop now and say, finally, he talks about infusing more capital into public housing and into communities that have historically been hurt by mortgage discrimination um, and banking discrimination. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot. Um, but I will say what excites me and gives me hope about this bill is that I feel like for the first time in a long time, we have both an administration and two governing bodies, the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate, who understand the pressing concern for real housing reform in our country. And what gives me even more hope than that is that we have an engaged and active electorate all of you on this call, all of us who showed up in November and again in January to deliver these governing trifectas. And we're not going to stop. We are going to make sure that this next package is as bold and, and to scale as it needs to be to solve the many problems facing our communities. Kiana, there's a question in the chat here. And for those of you who are um, wanting to ask questions, please put your questions in the question box. Um, but do we have any idea when this goes into effect? I mean, these are all great proclamations, but when are, when are people actually going to start seeing some of these resources in their communities? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it's actually one of the problems. So as you were saying, Alicia, there, there is at this point trillions of dollars in funding and in support for all of these different policies. But one of the huge problems, particularly for Black communities, is that where's the money? I mean, we still have people that haven't even received their stimulus checks. So the short, unsatisfying answer is that now. Things are currently happening now. But I will say HUD and the Treasury were decimated by the previous administration. And so they really didn't have the capacity or bandwidth or expertise to roll out some of these plans in the way and with the speed that we needed them rolled out. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the longer answer is that we have a champion at HUD now, former Representative uh, Marsha Fudge, now Secretary Fudge, who is an ally not just for housing, not just for our communities, but for fairness and for justice and equity overall. And so I have a lot of hope that she is going to make sure that HUD is properly funded and staffed to actually move the legislation okay. or to move the funds. Ms. Kate, how about you? What are your thoughts on this? What, where are you seeing the strengths and some of the gaps in the American Rescue Plan and the infrastructure bills? So in terms of the uh, funds available, to just go back to the, to the last question, the money is coming from the federal government, but it's actually going to be distributed at the state and local level. Again, municipalities over a certain size are actually getting a, a separate allocation of these funds. So what needs to happen at this point is for both the states and locality to set up an infrastructure. They are not used to actually um, managing programs with this amount of money. Mm -hmm. So Kiana, you talked about a capacity issue at the federal level. There's also a capacity issue at the state level and at the local level. Some communities have already started um, implementing these programs. Again, I was on a call yesterday. So I know speaking uh, about the Atlanta metropolitan area, but I'm sure this is probably true around the country. Some communities have already started taking applications for these funds under the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Um, some are saying that they need a little more time, but I think all of them will have their programs up and running within the next 60 days. In Georgia, the State Housing Finance Agency 
has said that it's going to communicate with the other 12 localities that have received money so that they can coordinate and not necessarily duplicate services. So I would urge um, people uh, participating in this, again, if their city is over like 500,000, um, to check with the locality, but definitely to check with the state housing finance agency and see how the money is going to be rolled out and what the time frame is. One of the issues um, with, the, with most of the agencies implementing this program is that they are doing it online and everybody does not have a computer, or everybody does not have access to broadband to internet. So that is one issue. Some um, localities are being, I guess, more proactive and actually going to different apartment complexes where they know the target population may live, live so that they can take the application on site and help people through the process. But not everybody's doing that. So on the one hand, this is necessary because there's a pandemic. But on the other hand, the pandemic actually limits how the money is being rolled out and how fast it is being rolled out. Uh, another thing too is that because it's, it's federal money, there are certain requirements in place that also mitigate against people being able to participate in the program to be able to actually get um, rental assistance. So for this, um, for this uh, I guess the second tranche and third tranche, um, the money is actually going to land, it's going to go to landlords, but they're looking for landlords and tenants to file joint applications. In some instances, landlords are saying they, are, they don't want the money. They would rather be able to um, evict the tenant and do something else with the unit. The, uh, some landlords are not necessarily interested in evicting a tenant, but they have some concern about the restrictions placed on federal money. So there are still some barriers, some challenges to be overcome. There are some programmatic glitches to work out in order for this money to do what it's intended to do. Mm. Woo. Okay, so for those of you who are joining us, if you have questions, go ahead and drop those in the question box because we are getting ready to tie up this conversation. You know, we like to give it to you short and sweet, honey, just the main things. But um, before we do, I just want to kind of put out a call to action here. We have a very narrow window of opportunity to make our voices heard and to influence upcoming legislative packages and to make sure that our communities are being prioritized and protected. And that is exactly what we're doing with the Build Back Boulder mandate. It provides a legislative framework, a roadmap, if you will, for how to make Black Lives Matter. Okay, so <laughs> um, how we accomplish this is we need 20,000 sign-ons to this mandate. We're almost, we're like halfway there. So you need to help us get over the top. We're gonna deliver this mandate to the administration, but they need to hear from you. So allow us to help you help yourself. You know what I'm saying? Okay, um, other things I wanna say here is that Look, when we speak with one voice, we are super powerful. We already spoke with a roar, actually, honey, in November. And then again in Georgia in January where they tried it, you know what I'm saying? And they still trying it. But we're not going to let them finish it because we already know what the deal is. But in order for that to happen, we need to stay engaged and we need to turn the pressure up. So um, what we're asking you to do is sign on to this mandate. And it's really easy to do. Text, send a text right now. Text mandate, okay, mandate to 510-405-4549. Again, 510-405-4549. Text mandate to um, that number and you will join us in delivering a powerful message to this administration that these are good first steps, honey, but don't let that first step be your last step. We got a lot of work to do. We are in a deep hole and a tornado's coming. Okay, um, I wanna walk through some of the demands too that are in this mandate. I mean, the STEMI was good, you know what I'm saying? It was good, 1400 bucks, that was good. But $1,400 for a year? People have been out of work for a year? 
people ain't been able to do what they need to do for a year. Come on, child. So check this out. $2,000 a month checks until the panties over. Okay. And even that is a start, but it's not a finish. Um, we want equitable access to the COVID-19 vaccine for our communities. We want student debt cancellation, and we want a $15 federal minimum wage, among other things. So jump on up in it with us, y'all. I'm going to put the number in the chat. I want to see if there's any questions coming through. Um, and in the meantime, I also thank you, Conceited Creations. I appreciate you. Text mandate to that number. Um, in the meantime, I want to thank you, uh, Kiana from Black to the Future Action Fund. And also, I want to thank you, Miss Kate Little from Georgia Stand Up, one of the baddest organizations in the country, really, but I know y'all holding it down in Georgia. Um, we want to thank you for joining us, and thanks to everybody here for joining us as well. 510-405-4549. Text mandate to that number. In the meantime, we're going to save this conversation, so you'll be able to find it on our IG Live. So if you jumped in a little bit late because, you know, you had to work, you got to do things, we understand, child, we got you. We're going to load this on our page so you'll be able to come back to it. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate y'all. Peace out. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.